from Writer's Welcome screen, we can select New Solution. From the New Solution dialog, we can select the ASP.NET Core Web Application category found on the left-hand side. From the New Solution dialog, we can provide some settings and select the project template type. Optionally, we can set the SDK version and initialize a Git repo, which is always a good idea. For most developers, starting with either Web App or Web App Model View Controller is best. In this case, we'll choose Web App as our template. Once initialized, we can run our project. There we have it, a running ASP.NET Core application. At the heart of every ASP.NET Core project lies the startup class, which allows us to configure our application. In this file, we can load configuration, register dependencies, and set the order of our ASP.NET request pipeline. The first notable method in the startup class is the constructor, which receives an iConfiguration value. The iConfiguration instance gives us access to the settings found in appsettings.json and appsettings.development.json. The next is Configure Services, which accepts an iService collection interface. This method allows us to register dependencies and frameworks. In this project, we have registered the Razor Pages framework. Finally, we have the Configure method, which takes two parameters, iApplicationBuilder and iWebHostEnvironment. This method helps us shape our runtime request pipeline. From requiring a secure connection, serving static files, and handling request routing. As ASP.NET developers, we'll find ourselves coming back to this file often as our application needs evolve. In this video, we'll explore registering dependencies in our ASP.NET Core application. We'll be focusing on the configure services method and performing registrations through the iService collection interface. Throughout this video, we'll see the behavior of our Hello World service change. The Hello World service is being injected into a Razor page, and the changes will become clear as we switch the registration types in configure services. We'll first register our dependency as transient. When registered as transient, our Hello World service will be created every time our application asks for an instance. When we run our project, we can see the two different outputs for instance 1 and 2. Changing our registration as scoped will create a single instance for each new web request. Running our application again reveals the two outputs are exactly the same for every page refresh. Finally, registering a dependency as singleton will limit our Hello World service to a single instance for the duration of our application's run. Refreshing the page shows us no change between each request. By changing the registration of our dependencies, we can dramatically change the behavior in our ASP.NET application. The runtime behavior of our ASP.NET Core's application is outlined in the configure method. Here, we can register middleware and determine the path our request will take. To understand middleware, we need to know that it operates on the nesting doll model. Each middleware holds a reference to the next in the chain and is responsible for continuing or breaking that chain. Ordering our middleware registration is important. Middleware are executed from first to last with no guarantee of running all registered middleware. A middleware instance has two options when handling a client's request. First, it can respond immediately with an HTTP response, breaking the chain and ending the request. Secondly, it can pass the incoming request to the next middleware in the chain. At this time, it can handle the returning response and change it or do nothing at all. Let's write a middleware. We'll return an HTML response, letting us know our middleware has handled the client's request. As we can see, our middleware responds immediately to the client's request. 
thus breaking the middleware chain. ASP.NET Core has many pre-packaged middleware, and there are open source contributions designed to enhance our application's request pipeline. Shaping our application depends on middleware, and it occurs here in the configure method. Route handling is essential to all web applications. In ASP.NET Core 3, we saw the introduction of endpoints, which allow us to guide client requests to handlers. An endpoint is made up of two essential properties, a URI path pattern and a request handler. A pattern can be made up of constants, placeholders, and constraints. Placeholder names are important to providing route value access to our handlers with a few reserved keywords. A handler can include a C-sharp delegate, a razor page, or a controller. We'll walk through several handler options to get a general appreciation of each. In our startup class, we have two important calls, use routing and use endpoints. All of our endpoints are configured in use endpoints, while use routing parses and provides route values from each incoming request. Our first option is mapping a handler directly in our use endpoints method. In this example, we see a primitive request response handler. Our handler uses a path value of name to return a response of hi and the given name. When calling our handler, we see the expected response. We can also map the HTTP methods of post, put, patch, and delete. Razor pages are mapped via convention from the root pages directory. By default, the route is the name of the file, but we can shape the route utilizing the at page declaration. Here, we see an optional path placeholder of name. When we run the request, we can see the privacy page change. Controllers are the last option in this video. We can utilize a default route pattern or use route attributes to define patterns for each handler. Here is default route, which is a fallback for unregistered controller methods. While this endpoint exists in many ASP.NET Core applications, it's recommended we use our next option, route attributes. In our controllers, we can decorate each method with an HTTP method and a route attribute. In our route attribute, we can define a pattern just like we could with other approaches. We can see the results of running requests against our controller actions. We'll start with our get method, followed by our post, then delete methods. For our delete method, we have a path value constraint requiring our value to be an integer. Routing is a rich topic, and we've just begun to scratch the surface. ASP.NET MVC utilizes the model view controller pattern. We can see this web project uses the pattern in the solution folder structure. In our startup class, we allow ASP.NET to scan and register all controllers. This allows our controllers and views to be created while opting into dependency injection. We also see how controller endpoints are registered in our configure method. Let's start by adding a new widgets controller. We'll start by adding a route attribute prefix to all endpoints in this controller. We'll also need to modify the index endpoint. This action has a widgets path. Our users will access this page using a get HTTP method. This particular endpoint will return a razor view. Views normally have a model that passes information from our controller action to our view. This model will pass a name value. In our view, we need an HTML form that allows us to pass information from the client back to a new create controller endpoint. 
Our create endpoint has a path of widgets forward slash create and uses the post HTTP method. Additionally, it will bind our form request to a create model using the from form attribute and redirect back to the index endpoint. It's a good practice to have a unique model for each endpoint. Back in our index action, we can now access the saved value by setting it on our index model. Back in our index view, let's display the update value for name. We now have a complete get post redirect loop in our MVC solution. This approach is effective for many web application scenarios. Let's see it in action. Posting the form, we can see the interplay between models, views, and controllers. A Razor Pages solution has a simple conventional folder structure with most app functionality found under the Pages folder. Each page represents an endpoint in our app with the index.cshtml being the default route. Expanding the nested files, we see that each endpoint is made of two parts, a Razor view and a C -sharp file. The Razor view is a mix of HTML and C -sharp syntax. Each page has a page directive and a reference to the page model that encapsulates the endpoint's behavior. We'll add a name property to our index model, which we'll use later. We'll also create a post handler. We'll store our name in temp data and perform a redirect to our get handler. The redirect avoids the dreaded confirm form resubmission issue on page refreshes. Let's add a form to close the loop. Note the ASP attributes on our HTML and the use of our name property. We can run our application and submit our name.